Welcome to Salt Lake City. I'm Steve. And I'm Derek. Derek. Yes. Knives. Indeed. I love them. Who doesn't? Soulless, heartless. People who don't want to get things done. You were an Eagle Scout. I was. Okay. Still am. What was the best knife you could have as a scout? I was a Swiss Army knife. Were you, were you a Victorinox guy? Uh-huh. That was like the knife. Well, yeah, because it was everything. It, it was everything wasn't, you needed. Except for tweezers and a toothpick because like, you lost those instantly. Yeah, it was, it was a really terrible version of every tool you needed. Then you get a little older and then you get a buck knife. Mm -hmm. I got a buck knife. My first one had a titanium handle. I got it as a birthday present. My grandpa gave me one that was about 90 years old. Those things last forever. But there has been a shift. I would, I would agree. There's, there's been a huge um, increase in interest in not only knives and like the utility of carrying a knife, but also knife making. I have here some of the knives that I've collected over time. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is uh, one of my favorites. My mom gave this to me. It's the profile of, of the mountain range near our house. I bought this one, right? A nice kind of cool Damascus pattern. And then I found a Kickstarter for this knife. More a machete than a knife. I decided I wanted to do something. I wanted to make my own. Behold. <laughs> my knife. You can tell. Equal quality. So I was gonna say similar quality. Similar quality. I call this a knife, some would call it rebar. But there's been a renewed interest also in making knives. Sure. And I think that one of the reasons why, a show that's on the History Channel called Forge and Fire, mm -hmm. where bladesmiths, blacksmiths, they've had armorers, farriers, mm -hmm. the guys who make horseshoes come on and compete to see who can make a knife. Everybody who's watching that's going, it's not so I could, I could totally do that. I could do that. I'm not an expert. I'm not a master. Yeah. So I thought I'd bring on another not master. <laughs> I'll let him explain that. Mm -hmm. Who was on Forge and Fire, Jared Williams, and we thought we'd have him come on and talk to us about blacksmithing and maybe heat up some steel and make some. Which yeah, is, I, honestly, I, I didn't see your episode before I met you. Mm -hmm. We were at uh, the at Wasatch Forge, yep. and my son is like, Dad. <laughs> right? So uh, you're the closest thing I have to a knife expert and master. However, I say that with an asterisk. Yes. Because you have a strong feeling about that word. I do have strong opinions about the term master. Master for me is somebody who's learned everything. And because you've mastered it, right? If you've mm -hmm. mastered something, you've pretty much reached the pinnacle of whatever sure. you're doing. And I dread the day that I ever reach the pinnacle of knife making because that means I don't have anything more to do. You can see my first attempt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a flat it's, piece of rebar. It's a flat piece of rebar. <laughs> <laughs> but you actually had more tools on this than I had on my first knife. So and I can tell that because it's been forged. We see a lot of comments online. I'm saving up the money because I want to get into blacksmithing. A good anvil is going to cost me two or three thousand dollars. Yep. And yeah, anvil, drill press, grinder, bandsaw, forge, hammers, 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 tongs, tongs, tongs. You know, and then they, they just keep adding this list of tools. They want the perfect setup. Uh, they perfect set up themselves out of the, the That's hobbies. exactly it. So they get so obsessed with the tools, they forget about what they're trying to make. Mm -hmm. And then they never make anything. Mm -hmm. Entry level. The most basic. The most basic. What do I need if I'm going to make my first actual knife? Because let's be honest, this doesn't count. Yeah. Well, if I had one tool to make a knife, I had the steel. Uh -huh. But I need one tool to make a knife. What would it be? File. That's it. You can make a complete knife with a file. Piece of steel, uh -huh. you can file your profile in, file your flats in, and you can file your handle in. Take some sticks, build fire in your backyard, heat it up, quench it in some used motor oil or some vegetable oil from the kitchen would actually work better. Temper it in your oven. You've just made a knife with a file. And I suggest everybody, everybody, when you make knives, if you want to make a knife, you make at least one with just a file. And then I became utterly obsessed uh -huh. and started working at a very young age and every dime I made, I bought tools with. It's a valuable lesson, right? It's a valuable lesson. <clears throat> Is it practical and will you get so frustrated very quickly that you don't want to do it anymore? Yes. It's an appreciation thing, but there's so much skill learned in learning how to use a file. So you made your file knife. Is that when you finally take your $2,000 and go buy a $2,000 anvil? No. What's next? Okay, that looks like just a block of steel. Exactly. The best beginner anvil you will ever have. Find any chunk of steel that's remotely heavy. 
Okay, so my first anvil was a three inch round, six inches long piece of steel that I found at my high school machine shop. Yeah. And I stuck that in the dirt next to my driveway. That was my first anvil. And that's all you need to start forging. Talk to me about why do you need a block of steel? Why wouldn't a, a rock or a big piece of, a big log or why, what, what is it about the, this? So mm -hmm. the great thing with these is you can go to a lot of scrap yards, junk yards all over the place and you can usually find a big block of steel, relatively cheap. You want weight. So you want something dense and heavy underneath the steel to support the hammer blow that's not just gonna move, wiggle, or shift. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you want 50 times the weight of your hand hammer. That's ideal. We're not being ideal. We We're just starting. want to start. I would totally make a knife right now on that. Let me show you a couple others that we've got around the shop. That's a legit piece of steel. Oh yeah. This is interesting. This was Derek's grandfather's. Mm -hmm. It's actually a ballast from a sailing ship. It's a no brainer. Yeah. That, I would mount that and that would be an integral part of my shop. And this looks nothing like when people think of like Coyote and the Roadrunner dropping yeah, anvils. Yeah, the Acme anvil. Yeah, this looks uh -huh. nothing no, like. Doesn't need to. Let me show you one other. The first anvil I bought. <laughs> Love the sound effects. <laughs> Is that a good anvil? That's technically an anvil shaped object. Explain to me an anvil shaped object. Well, the blue part. An object that's shaped like an anvil. Will this work for an anvil? Yes. Okay. Seriously. Yes, this will. It, it, it is a heavy piece of metal that's flat. This stuff tends to have a lot of voids and pockets in these things. They tend to be pretty bad and they, they just deteriorate so quick. Honestly, the amount of money you spend on this anvil, you could go to a scrapyard and buy a block of mild steel <laughs> and it would last longer than this anvil would. <laughs> this was a piece of railroad that was my mm -hmm. grandfather's. It, it's designed for high wear, high weight, mm -hmm. so it doesn't deform meaning it's got, it's got some hardness to it. So you can actually mount a piece of rail just on a stump and you've got a, a pretty serviceable anvil that mm -hmm. won't deform over time. Yeah. Um, you don't have a lot of weight to it, but for starting out, dude. Yeah. Railroad all day long. There, there is a time where investing in the anvil is worth it, but I always shy away from, you're just starting out, you need an anvil mentality. Tools don't make the maker, but a good maker can make tools do amazing things. As your skill set expands, so does your tool purchasing. You've got the resist. Yep, you got the resist. Now you need to go find yourself a good blacksmithing hammer. No, I think mine was a little bit bigger. Yeah. But not much different than that. I think mine was like a 20, 24 ounce smooth face mm -hmm. framing hammer. But pretty much, I mean, we're talking bare bones, right? We're talking a guy right. that's just wanting to figure it out. We're talking the next step from this. Exactly, you've got this. This now you can heat up and you can take your little piece of wood, you can heat this up in the campfire in your backyard. That's all you need, it's, it's flat. Mm -hmm. This is flat. Now you can point a, have a point in. Now you don't have to file a point in. Yeah. So now you've just quadrupled your efficiency. But you've leveled up the right way. You've leveled up the right way. You've leveled up systematically. Yeah, now we need a heat source. My first forge was a barbecue. You can run charcoal for a beginner forge. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with it. Coal's better, obviously, more sure. controllable, higher heat, all that. But I forged many knives on just uh, charcoal from this grocery store. And, yeah. and it works great for a beginner forge. Yeah. You can heat it up quickly. It's really cheap to run. You're not investing a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then moving into the propane forge. That's where you have two outs. You can make one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do suggest a propane forge, honestly. Charcoal's great, but it's smoky, it's dirty. A lot of fire hazard involved, mm -hmm. and a lot of people live in condensed subdivisions and places like that, and, and it's not conducive to charcoal forges. Mm -hmm. I ran I ran a coal forge for all of about two months, literally. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, this isn't gonna happen. I didn't have the resources to find a guy who was making small little one burner or two burner propane yeah. forges. So I hopped on the internet and I built one. Mm -hmm. Or you can buy one, pretty affordably as well too. Mm -hmm. As long as you follow the basic safety rules, they're safe, they're affordable. You can use them in smaller areas as long as you have good ventilation mm -hmm. with, without a lot of concern for fire hazards, fire dangers. That's what I like about propane forges. They are really safe, they're really efficient, they're really affordable. And they're really easy to, when you're done, they cool off, you can tuck them in the corner. At this point, I would definitely go kind of a simultaneous upgrade. Okay. It'd be like, let's start looking for a, a, a small, affordable, 
within our budget belt grinder. Mm -hmm. You know, if you got a budget for one by 30, get it. It's better than nothing. Right. If you got a budget for a two by 72, there's a lot of really affordable units out there. Mm -hmm. Get it, because that's such a universal machine. Right. And then, and then if you're wanting to continue down the forging path, there's like, you know, like what you've got here, you got a one burner. Let's move this out of the way here. Yeah. So let's talk forges, because now yeah. we're, we're like you said, we're leveling up. Yeah, we're leveling up. We're wanting to spend some money. We know we're going to commit to this, you know. So we, we've talked a little bit about belt grinders, things like that, mm -hmm. and then forges. You know, and you've got actually two really nice ones here, a little one burner, and then you've got a two burner. Um, I have a one burner at home that I love for when I'm doing a lot of smaller stuff because it's just really efficient on propane. Sure. And then I've got a couple bigger ones as well for if I'm doing bigger stuff. And I run, you know, if I'm doing a lot of big heavy Damascus, I run a bigger forge, obviously. Sure. But if I'm just forging out a couple little three or four inch blades, I'll strike up my one burner every time. What's the cost you're looking at? Yeah, you're, you're between 100 and 400 bucks for, for a forge. And it, honestly, if you're building it about the same price, you would be right. about 100 to 200 to build your own as well. So it's about sixes. And, and there's a lot of resources. If you Google searches, you'll bring up a dozen or more forge builders out there. You just plug it into propane and you can go anywhere. You don't need power for it. And it's just, it's literally just the same propane tank that as you your use barbecue. For your barbecue grill. You literally use your barbecue propane tank for it. Because when you're done working, you can just set it anywhere. Yeah. That's the beauty of the propane. And this is forge. this is the footprint that it has. It's like, very small. Yeah, that's what I love about propane forges. They're clean. Um, if you tune them right by adjusting um, the airflow, the airflow in that. So, side note: keep a carbon monoxide detector near your forge. Mm -hmm. Two reasons: one, it keeps you from dying from carbon monoxide poisoning. Good, good. Which idea. is always good. We don't like dying. Yeah. And two, it can help you tune your forge. So you have a carbon monoxide detector next to your forge, and it's not going off. All the carbon monoxide is being burned up in the forge. Your forge is running neutral. You've got an efficient running forge. We're putting one on our list. And you're not dying. <laughs> <laughs> it's a twofer. What else do we need to know? A lot of the periphery tools you get in like drill press, that's pretty self-explanatory. Sure. It's for drilling holes. Um, those can run the gambit. I know full-time knife makers that run little tiny bench top drill mm -hmm. presses. That's all they've ever needed for what they make. Sure. I run a, I run a milling machine, a miniature mm -hmm. bench top milling machine because of what I do. Mm -hmm. So that's all indicative of what you want to make. You're gonna just absorb and find tools over the years. You're gonna constantly be adding. I probably got 300 files. I've got so many freaking tools I've bought over the years for obscure little things that I want to do. I'll buy the tool for it and use it once a year. So what you're saying yeah. is it's okay to have a lot of hammers. No more hammers, Steve. Yes, it is. <laughs> if you're getting into forging, your hammer is gonna be your main tool. Well, we're that. Oh, here, yeah, just use this. I don't know. And five bucks. Can't get me fun of having too many hammers. So we've started with the basic claw hammer. Sure, because we because everybody has a hammer for hanging picture frames. Right. Why is that not ideal? When you when you start really moving into moving metal. Um, so a ball peen. I've actually got I've got a 32 ounce ball peen that I picked up years ago. I bought it because I was at I was at a, an overstock warehouse. I got it for five bucks. It was like cool, a five dollar ball peen. You just buy it, right? You don't mm -hmm. think, I didn't think it was gonna become my go-to forging hammer. The balance of the head just felt so good. Mm -hmm. it, turned, it turned into my main forging hammer for years. The beauty of it. So a ball peen, when you're moving metal, small area pushes more steel quickly, more efficiently, mm -hmm. right? Because you're hitting less area, so you're gonna do more movement. Flat will flatten it out more. Like this one, you've got this nice big flat face. Mm -hmm. That is fantastic for flattening a piece of metal. But now you want to make it wider. <laughs> you want to drop that on the thing by catching it with your watch. Yeah, it's absolutely. really important to do. <laughs> I'm working on that. Yes, it's a technique I've mastered over the years. So you have a rounded face, uh -huh. and this is actually beautifully set up this way. You have this wonderful rounded face here. So as you're hitting a piece of metal, that's going to dimple the inside and push it out very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then you can take this flat face, and then you can flatten it. So now you've expanded the metal, and then you can flatten it, and you can literally do that that quick. That's the beauty of investing in different types of hammers, is you have two working faces to do two very different jobs, mm -hmm. and you can very quickly move from one to the other. Because they, I mean, when you talk about peens, everybody talks about ball peen hammers. Ball peens. But there's cross peens, cross peen, straight peen, diagonal peens. Peen. Diagonal peens. Yeah. So that's why you actually want a few different hammers, is right. because they all have intended purposes. Another issue with hammers mm -hmm. is obviously different size hammers, right? Yes. 
right? You don't necessarily, bigger isn't necessarily better. No, control. Right. Control trumps all. But uh, I use a 32 ounce. I can move more metal personally accurately with a 32 ounce than I can with like a three or a four pound. If you can run a smaller hammer with more accurate blows, you're gonna move metal more efficiently than a big massive hammer that's just kind of flopping in your hand. It's just like working out. You sure. keep hammering, suddenly this is a little too light. You're like, man, that's just not quite working. Oh, hey, this one's a little heavy. Oh, that feels good. Yeah, it's because you built muscle up, right? right? And you've built skill. Mm -hmm. You start with the hammer that I so eloquently shoved off the table. <laughs> you know, you, sure. you're, you're learning skill. Your body is now learning different ways of moving. Mm -hmm. and, and as those expand, you can go bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, if you want to get to a four pound hammer, you can. But it's much like the way a baseball player will pick a bat weight that works it's, for them. It's exactly, that's exactly it. You know, you find the hammer that works, that, that fits you, and everybody's different. Everybody has that one hammer that they get that just works, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you and then you're good. And then you move on from there to, you know, you can get into the power hammers and the presses, and that starts doing a lot more work, and that's a whole other conversation. That's, to yeah, if you don't mind. I'd love to throw some, if you got yeah. a, bit, a little bit of time. No, we do. Let's, let's uh, throw some propane uh, in the forge. Yeah. Let's heat let's up some steel. Heat up and... some steel and move some steel. Yeah. We don't have knives yet. Not yet. They're, they're Part one of whatever. <laughs> However many it ends up being. However many yeah. it takes. But thanks for, for coming on. There are always gonna be people in the world with with expertise that, that we don't possess. And, and that's how you learn, is by um, having proximity and time to people who have gone before and had more experience. And that's how knowledge is shared. Right. Our relationship with steel as humans, it's we've had so long to refine our processes with it like we're pretty freaking good after a, a millennia of working steel we're still learning oh yeah which which is the whole master thing i'm thrilled to see how this is going to turn out um it was fun to be behind the camera today uh, <laughs> but uh, but it's always fascinating to learn anything it's always really enjoyable to watch someone who is uh who is very, very good at their craft, do what they do well. Um, it's it's just an enjoyable thing to see somebody do something and do a good job of it. So, And, and I'll be honest, I enjoyed forging alongside of someone who's <laughs> further down the master path. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Um, as usual, like and subscribe. Question this week is, who's been the person down the master path that you've followed? Um, who's that person that, that you're trailing? If you've got people that you've mentored, uh, what's it been like? Ideally, I guess you got people on both sides of you, right? Yeah. Always. Yeah. All right. Always looking forward. Always remembering back. Well, uh, I look forward to finishing these knives. And with that, let's keep calm and make on. What's that? Thanks, Sal.